Boston. Um, I'm based actually um, uh, out of Montpelier, Vermont, like many of you. I've been uh, working from home uh, here in Montpelier um, uh, all over the country. Um, and um, uh, we're going to present to you the, the results of, of um, the, the different parts of our feasibility study. And it includes, it's going to include um, some information on uh, the survey that we helped uh, to conduct, the high level design that we did, actually, two versions of the high level design, a seven town design, including the, the members, uh, current members of the CUD, and an eight town design that the seven members plus Stowe. And we're going to talk um, at length about um, the, the business model and the financing and the, and the public private partnership model um, that, we've, that we've put together and the results of that analysis. Uh, let me uh, uh, stop here. And um, Fred, if you are ready, uh, maybe we can just introduce the, um, the other members uh, of the Tilson team. That's a good idea. We'll go briefly and I'll start. Uh, Frederick Fight, uh, broadband consultant for Tilson, um, have, have had the pleasure of working on your feasibility study and hopefully to push it forward with your uh, business plan as well. Um, and uh, my colleagues, Brett Nichols and Andrew Frame have also been working on the project and I'll let them introduce themselves as well. Hi, I'm Brett Nichols. Um, I'm actually in sunny and sometimes Ooh, some connectivity issues with, with Colorado. Um, I Brett, your connection is a little off. So you're in and out. Let's just, uh, Brett, Brett's our, uh, yeah, I'm having some problems consulting with engineer on our project. Good, good argument for fiber, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's really, it's really interesting, you know, as, uh, I, I, as I'm a broadband consultant and work mostly on rural projects and, uh, as such, you know, presentations and, 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 you know, it's, we're, we're constantly running into issues with, with customers, with, uh, Zoom meetings and such, and it does just drive the point home. Brett, I'll just point out if you have connectivity issues during your part of the presentation, I'll be happy to uh, to fill in on your your slides. But Drew, if you're up and running, yeah, yeah, thanks, Brett. I am Drew Frame. I'm a member of a, the broadband consulting group at Tilson, based out of Portland, Maine, uh, and primarily I'm focused on uh, project finance analysis and uh, helping clients uh, kind of break down the numbers and associated with these projects. And Drew's portion of the presentation is pretty much uh, the lion's share of it. Um, we'll we'll uh, have two relatively brief uh, sections before we get into the numbers, but ultimately this is largely about the numbers. Um, and I'll start to share my screen and the presentation in just a sec. I wanted to ask Leah, uh, first of all, just a, a one or two bookkeeping things. I don't know if you wanted to record this. I didn't hear anyone mention that, but if so, I suppose now would be a good time to do that. Oh, I see it's recording, excuse me. Yep. Um, also, you mentioned earlier, you wanted to hold questions to the end. And if that's your policy and that's mandatory, we will respect that. Um, I think that for a practical matter, if questions are, if anyone wants to ask questions during the, the presentation itself, we're, we're kind of prepared for that. And with the, the scope, um, of the information that we're going to be going through, it might be better. Otherwise, people should take notes about what they want to ask a question about, because by the time we get to the end, we might be well past that subject. We, we want to be sure to end at at least the formal part of the program at 830. Mm -hmm. So if if you ask for if you allow questions in the middle, make sure that you leave enough time to still be ending at 830. So people get everything if they have to leave. That's all. Well, we will be uh, we will be cognizant of that, and uh, in in the interest of time, let's uh, we'll get started. Then I will share my screen. Let me move that little bug to the lower left hand corner, and uh, we'll start the presentation. Um, Chris, shall I just get into it, or do you want to do a very just, just very, you know, just very briefly, I, I previewed these are the, you know, the major portions of our agenda tonight. Um, 
this agenda is going to largely be presented by um, uh, Fred, Brett, and, uh, and and Drew. And you know, for the members of the CUD board, uh, at least some of you have have seen um, very similar versions of this, although we've made some adjustments and um, and extensions um, based on your feedback. Um, but we're we're not making the assumption that um, the folks who have seen this, at least in an earlier stage, the first time. Um, we're not making the assumption that everybody has that baseline. So we're, you know, you may see some repetition um, from our prior, uh, prior presentation, but, you know, we're, we're trying to bring everybody up to the same, the same level. Um, with that, let me, let me turn, pass the baton back to Fred. Thank you. So we're going to, we're going to probably spend the majority of our time on uh, sections three and four. And uh, with that in mind, we're gonna move relatively swiftly through sections one and two. Uh, section one is the survey summary at the very beginning of the uh, engagement, the consulting engagement. Tilson stood up a survey as we would normally do with this type of engagement, uh, a market research, research survey, the goal of which was to obtain uh, you know, a, a myriad of uh, different market research uh, information the answers to various questions. And one of the primary goals of the market research survey was to determine uh, information that will help inform our assumptions for the model for take rate, or, or how many people will actually subscribe to service over new infrastructure if it were installed, therefore how many people would end up contributing revenue to, uh, to, to the network. Um, it's worth noting that typically broadband surveys in unserved, unserved, underserved areas, the respondents do tend to skew towards people who are unserved, dissatisfied with their current service. And we anticipated those results and that, that was reflected in the results. And we, we did take that into, into account. But as you can see, the uh, the survey results, we received a 9% response rate. We typically like to see somewhere in between an eight and 12% response rate, 10% being sort of the, the, the ideal number. 9% is just fine. It's a very good response. And there was a yes or no uh, answer uh, uh, possibility for the question, would you take service? And then also an unsure and those that did not answer the question Worst case scenario, manipulating the number, you have a 67% positive. Um, uh, best case for negative 1.7 negative. And if you simply manipulate these numbers in, in, in various ways and add the unsure and not available, you have a, you have a, a best case scenario, positive response of 83, worst case negative response of 33. There was, these responses were as anticipated, so somewhat uh, positive, uh, uh, supportive response to new infrastructure. And this, these results did inform the take rate estimates that we included in our, in our modeling. And we'll discuss that in a more detail going forward. Um, as I mentioned briefly before, the responses to the survey do tend to skew to locations, to people that are poorly served, dissatisfied with their service. Um, this is a screenshot from the online uh, map that we've built for Lamoille. This is an ArcGIS online map, and you should have access to it. If you don't have the web address for this map, you can request it from, from us, from Tilson or from Leia. Um, but this, and, and there's a, a tremendous amount of information there, and we could, uh, you know, show you a little bit more about how to properly navigate it. But this depicts the, in the, the green pyramids, the responses of uh, to the survey that were positive and the little brown dots, um, state broadband availability information, the somewhat brown ones indicate service of 4-1 or better. The uh, participants in the call that claim to have 7-1 service approximately are probably in this category, 4-1 to 10-1. And as you can see, the responses to the survey basically do track. This is just a snapshot, a very small snapshot of the overall uh, Lamoille County, and all of these results are available uh, countywide on the map, and you can scroll around and, and, and zoom into the uh, a particular area if you're interested. This is the survey results as they break down per town. We had a 9% response rate, and as you can see, that's somewhat evenly distributed amongst the eight towns, including Stowe. Some towns exceeded that 9% average. Some towns were 
below that 9% average, as you would expect in, uh, in a, a, a county with uh, many towns that have some different characteristics. And this is a graphical representation. The dots represent the physical locations of the respondents to the survey. And as you can see, they're somewhat evenly distributed. Walcott and Elmore are excluded from the survey as they are not members of the CUD. So the clustering is, uh, you know, see there's, there's some fair bit of clustering in Stowe, as you can see, and, and as well in, in other areas as well. And uh, as I mentioned, the, this information plus a tremendous amount more is available on the ArcGIS online map, including the high level designs that we're about to discuss. And uh, if anyone that does not previously have uh, some information or instructions, if you will, about navigating the, uh, the online map, we can, we can uh, take care of that and uh, give you some further information about that because there is a tremendous amount of information there. Um, Brett, curious about your connection and if you're uh, um, able to uh, just give a brief summary of the high level designs, the high level design process. Check to see if you're muted. I'm just going to assume that our colleague Brett has some connectivity issues, which should not be uh, too terribly <laughs> surprising. As I mentioned, Tilson has a lot of projects which are rural, rural, uh, unserved, under, underserved communities. So we are very familiar with connectivity issues during Zoom meetings and such. Um, but I wanted to go over the high level design process. We, we took a, an iterative high level design process, which means we did numerous high level designs. We started from a, a certain point. We tend to start with the point that includes, that is all inclusive, that does not uh, remove anything. And then we, we continued with the design process, several variations until we got to the point where we needed to be. For the purpose of the, the grant funding program in particular, we did need to get to a, a business model or we did model two versions. So business models that were, I should say financial models that were cash flow positive within three years. That's the requirement to move forward to the next stage. So basically we started with all of the broadband addressable locations within the, uh, the, all, the eight town area, we, the CUD member towns plus Stowe. And we, we found that the model basically did not support that in general terms. And we can discuss that in more detail going forward. We then identified the very high cost locations, those locations that were the highest cost to serve. We did need to reduce or remove capital costs from the network design. That was basically the requirement in order to move forward with su successful financial modeling. So we, we did identify those locations. We identified 1,248 locations and that left 10,222 locations in the final design. Those difficult to serve locations were, you know, underground is much more expensive than aerial, uh, very, very low dense, uh, low density areas per mile, so to speak, are very expensive. So there's a slide coming up, which, which has a graphical depiction of those, but uh, essentially those were value engineered out of the model in order to make it cash flow positive within three years. So those 1,248 locations represented about 11% about of the total locations for cost savings of approximately 38%. That's correct, yeah. So we have, uh, you know, a capital cost savings of $23 million by removing those 1,248 locations. That does not mean that those 1,248 locations will never get broadband. They could simply be part of a network extension program and network extension uh, plan. But for the confines of the feasibility study that we are looking at now, they did need to be temporarily removed or removed from this modeling exercise. Um, before the removal, the average cost per premise or the cost per premise was uh, $6,417 per premise passed. Um, and then after the removal, after the value engineering exercise, that was uh, the, the cost per premise was 4,000. So you can see the, the purpose of doing that. 
And in the lower right of this slide, and you'll have a copy of this deck, of course, you can see the served nature, if you will, of the 1,248 locations that were removed, although they were removed primarily for the cost to connect. Hey, Fred. <laughs> Fred, this Relatively, is Brett. I'm sorry, go ahead. This is Brett. Um, I've just rejoined. Sorry about that. I appreciate you doing that slide. If you want me to go ahead and take this over, I can. Oh, uh, that's all right. I got a flow going. And I want to okay. <laughs> I want to go through this so Drew has enough time for his his stuff. This is a, a graphical representation. Um, this information is also on the ArcGIS online, the high level designs, plus uh, there is a layer on there that were the, the locations that were trimmed. We use the, the, the term trimmed or removed, removed temporarily from the, the design. A, a temp, by temporarily, I mean they could potentially be the subject of another program that was for network extensions. And I think the term network extensions is appropriate because as you can see, many of the locations that were removed are on the, you know, the, the perimeter the you know the, the they they would require a continuation of the network build so in order to connect them the, the network would need a a way to be able to fund the the continuation of that build but as you can see this is a represent, representation of what was removed low density underground service and uh in general higher cost to connect to than other this is just a snapshot of the the larger design this is just a graphical depiction of the uh, eight town design, so all CUD members plus Stowe. This is really just a placeholder graphical depiction. The URL to the map, your, your online uh, ArcGIS map is on the upper right. If anyone needs a, a link to that separately, feel free to just email me. The map that is online is very, very, very good. You can zoom in all the way to the, the home level, the premise level, scroll around anywhere you want, turn on and off numerous layers, enter an address and zoom to it. Uh, this is really just a crude representation of, of, what we've, of what we've placed online. This is the seven town design. So all CUD members, Stowe not included. And we'll discuss the, you know, the importance of the difference between these two configurations, these two models. Uh, right now. So we'll move into the business case analysis. This is kind of the heart of it, after all. And uh, uh, I'll hand it off to Drew. And I wanted to reiterate with respect to, uh, to Leia's comments and your rules. If you, you know, I, I think that if you want to ask questions during this with respect to the time limit as well, We'll try to be really brief, but I think that might be appropriate and we'll try to just be really brief with the responses. Yeah, yeah, let's give it a go. Thank you. Drew, all, right. all right, thanks. Um, so I, as Fred mentioned, uh, my role in, in this project has been to look at the, the financial analysis. Um, how I'll approach this is I'm going to kind of give you a general overview of you know a proposed uh, a model a partnership model, um, and then we'll dive into some high-level finances, uh, looking at the project from a uh, you know, capital standpoint and operating standpoint. Uh, I'll give you some definitions, and we'll dive in a little bit deeper on financial analysis uh, to kind of give you the holistic picture of, of the project. Um, so starting with the, the proposed partnership model, um, I'm going to preface this with saying, you know, Lamoille's network is relatively small, which makes the project economics challenging. This is not, this is not unique to Lamoille. This is a problem nationwide facing you know, rural communities everywhere. Uh, that's why you're seeing so much discussion around you know, broadband funding, uh, in particular around election time uh, and in, at the, both the, uh, the state and federal level. Um, so with that being said, uh, you know, we've assumed uh, that in developing this network, um, the, the owner will hire a network operator who will be able to provide some scale uh, in operating the system. So someone who has experience in managing these various systems all over the country. Um, this network, the network owner will build, finance the network uh, and is responsible for the outside plant maintenance, customer installations, network reinvestments, um, and then managing local employees. Uh, the network operator, so the person you'd be con or the entity you'd be contracting with, will be responsible for the network operation and monitoring, uh, the day-to-day -day customer service, billing, bandwidth management, voice service, 
um, and just general centralized operations. Uh, the network, op uh, network operator will collect the revenue from the subscribers on behalf of the owner who will uh, in turn pay the uh, network operator fee per subscriber. Fred, do you want to move forward? So as Fred uh, discussed, we looked at two uh, project designs, an uh, eight town project and the seven town project with Stowe removed. Uh, the eight town project uh, has is about 604 fiber uh, route miles. Uh, as Fred mentioned, a, a little over 10,000 premises passed uh, and a total initial capital cost of around 32.37.2 million dollars. Sorry. Uh, the seven town project is about 470 miles uh, with 7,500 premises passed uh, and it, with a premises pass per mile 16.1. That's important because it highlights uh, the relative density of Stowe to the region. Um, you know, intuitively, if you think about you know, the map, there is a lot of density. You're building out this network, getting in a sense more bang for your buck uh, and passing areas of higher density, which you know, can significantly improve the business case. Um, that seven town project does come in at a lower capital cost of 28.4 million, but um, you know, the, the model is a little more challenging and we'll get into that you know, later on in this presentation. Um, so going forward, you know, looking at the CapEx key assumptions, I'm going to be primarily focused on the eight town model. So over the next few slides, just keep in mind we're, we're assuming Stowe would be included uh, since that's the, uh, the clearer business case. Um, we're, you know, we're assuming that you're going to be seeing a, a 24 month initial construction period. Uh, operations of the network begin lies with portion of the network um, are available. Um, that's to ensure that you're able to generate revenue as fast as, as possible. Um, we're assuming that you know, the model is based on uh, an 89% construction path that, uh, that will be aerial. Uh, aerial construction tends to be a little bit cheaper than underground construction. Um, and that we're assuming the estimated make ready cost is $8,000 per mile. Uh, make ready is just the preparation of poles uh, for the, you know, in the construction process. This value I you know, have to mention can vary widely um, and can make or break projects. Uh, we're comfortable with this number, but you know, as we move you know, forward in our analysis, getting a, a strong sense of what this number would be would look like uh, is crucial to the development of the project. Um, our CapEx estimates also include contingencies and materials and labor margin to give a more accurate picture of uh, you know, the potential overall cost of the project. I'll just briefly add that the 24 month initial construction period may seem ambitious. It is doable, but it is required for our modeling due to the requirement that the project be cash flow positive within three years. So getting as many potential subscribers initially connected to the network as quickly as possible and having the full pool of, of potential subscribers available uh, after 24 months is, is part of the, the model and part of uh, what was required to get it cash flow positive within three years. Thanks, Fred. Um, your annual operating expenses, if you wanna kind of take a very high look at this, um, I've chosen to show you year five because that's a, you know, probably one of the earlier years in which the network is mature with a, a set amount of uh, customers and uh, general operations that can give you a good picture going forward. Um, you know, your biggest expense here is your cost of services, this, the cost associated with uh, providing uh, internet and phone services to various clients. Uh, you know, your various OPEX factors include, you know, aerial plant, which can be about $580 per mile, underground plant, 146, um, and then, you know, new subscriber counts after initial construction uh, is around $47. Uh, approximately each year, kind of going forward, uh, is uh, about $909,000 in uh, fixed costs, uh, but keep in mind we're applying a 2.5% annual inflation um, costs going forward, uh, with the exception of bandwidth, which, Fred, if you move to the next slide. I just wanted to add the aerial plant and underground figures would require a, a, a multiplier of a, of a thousand. Right, that's the aerial plant would be 58,000. That, that's a, a, would require a, a notation for 
for that to be uh, multiplied by a thousand. But we'll we'll we'll. Thanks, Brent. Um, and so to give you a, a more uh, raw number sense, I've I've put together a, a breakdown of the various opex costs year one through five, so you can see the progression and how we got to where we were in the previous slide. Um, there's a lot of numbers here. Uh, you know, I, I won't go into each one, uh, but it is worth mentioning you know, that the, you know, the, the your costs at first um, are largely tied to your fixed costs, uh, which uh, shouldn't be a surprise, um, but then shifting more to your subscriber-based costs as you pick up more subscribers over, over time. So we're gonna kind of transition now. That was a you know a very high level view of the, the costs associated with construction of one of these projects. Um, I'm gonna kind of shift gears a little bit uh, and start looking at the project from a, a holistic view uh, in terms of revenue and, and applying the, you know, the operations um, figures that I just presented. Uh, so to give you a few definitions um, that you're gonna see in the next few slides, uh, the first is EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. Um, this is a pretty standard financial figure that's applied, uh, you know, in many different cases, you know, in terms of in financial modeling. Um, for the purpose of our model, where this you can just think of this as operating revenues to total revenue minus operating costs. Uh, but you know, EBITDA is a standard figure where you're just trying to normalize um, operating revenues so that you can compare them uh, from project to project. Uh, but in our case, this is a you know, very simple, again, operating revenue figure. ARPU, which is your annual, our average revenue per user, uh, which is the total revenue divided by the number of subscribers. Um, we've broken down a number of our, our so, excuse me, we've broken down our subscribers into three different categories uh, that I'm going to show in a, in a few slides. Um, and so the ARPUs are set based on the categories that I'll be showing you um, and the number of uh, customers we expect to, to fall within each category. Um, free cash flow. Uh, this in our model represents the cash generated after accounting for cash outflows to support operations and maintain capital assets. And IRR, which is the internal rate of return. Um, it's a fairly standard metric. Uh, in particular, looking at uh, projects from an investor's point of view. Um, for the purpose of our model, you can just think of it as uh, your return based on the amount of cash that you put into the project uh, versus the amount of cash you're expected to get out. Uh, so it's a you know, pretty, pretty simple figure to, to uh, kind of conceptualize in our, in our project. So as I mentioned, we, uh, we break down revenue uh, into three different categories based on customer class, uh, enterprise and institutional, residential and commercial. Um, our initial take rate that we uh, are expecting uh, is around 10%. So that's the, the percentage of, uh, of pa customers per, pa per passing um, that we're expected to see. Uh, that will be subscribing. Um, this will rise to 45%, 35% for enterprise and institutional subscribers by month 60, and 48.5% by month 120. Uh, this is a fairly typical take rate curve that we've established working with um, uh, clients in rural areas. Um, and we're comfortable with, with these assumptions. Uh, the, the most important figure here on this slide is the, the residential ARPU. Um, at 8850, uh, that includes internet and phone service. Um, this, you know, residential clients are about 90% of the, the clients are expected, we're expecting to, you know, subscribe to, to your services. Um, and so you know, that number is going to, the residential number is going to drive uh, the overall model success. In general, in these models, ARPU uh, and take rate are the kind of two most important figures to success in the, in the project. And as um, those numbers change, uh, the project's feasibility can also change. And so with that being said, I've, I put together a small table here that shows how the target take rate um, 
can change uh, or, or sensitivity to the target take rate uh, can change uh, you know, the project's feasibility. Uh, keep in mind that you know, the, the 40, 45, 50, 55, and 60% figures that I have under target take rate are commercial and residential target take rate only. Um, we don't expect enterprise and institutional clients to make up a, a large amount of uh, your client base. Uh, in fact, we're, we kind of project that to be around less than 1%. Um, so what we've done is a, kind of apply these sensitivities to the commercial and residential target take rate only. Um, as you can see, uh, you know, as I'm, you know, this is, uh, these changes are um, highly uh, sensitive to, to the take rate. Um, and so, you know, while we, there is a, a, some significant challenges if your take rate does decline, uh, there are, is upside um, and significant upside uh, if your take rate uh, comes in uh, at a higher level than we're anticipating. So wrapping all of this together, um, I've put together a pro forma cash flow for the first 10 years and the eight town model. Um, again, there's a lot of numbers here. And what I'm going to kind of highlight is that uh, your EBITDA, your operating revenue uh, is positive in year two and that your free, free cash flows are positive in year three. Um, you know, operating revenue and free cash flows um, can make and break all these projects. Uh, and what's encouraging about this project in particular is that you have fairly healthy uh, EBITDA margins or operating revenue margins um, that are sustained across the course of the project. This isn't necessarily the case uh, in many rural projects that we're looking at. Um, so it is encouraging here that, you know, that we're seeing these types of figures in, in our estimations. Uh, and Fred, if you move to the next slide, as I mentioned, uh, those margins persist uh, across the whole 20 year projected period. And Fred, we won't spend too much time here. Um, so what we're gonna do now is kind of dive into the, the financing options. Uh, these can get pretty complicated um, and vary from you know, infrastructure project to infrastructure project, whether it's broadband, surface transportation, so on and so forth. Um, with that being said, uh, what we've done is put together a very, you know, uh, a proposed uh, capital structure uh, that we feel could, could feasibly uh, meet the needs of the project, uh, in particular, the uh, free cash flow positivity by year, year three. Um, while also providing and uh, fulfilling the mission of the project, which is to provide uh, broadband in the area. There are several constraints though that, that uh, drive these financing choices. First, that the CUD does not have a revenue track record, which makes it difficult to finance the initial capital entirely with CUD borrowing. Um, with this being said, uh, relationships with local banks and financial institutions can actually overcome this. Uh, we've seen this in rural areas across the country. Um, banks have to meet certain standards as they apply to the Community Reinvestment Act uh, and core regulators at the federal level that oversee those standards have actually uh, broadened the definition um, to receive credit for meeting community re uh, CRA standards um, to include rural broadband, uh, to try and encourage local financial institutions to, to partner um, with communities to, to develop these networks. Um, the second constraint is that the return on investment would be insufficient for most investors in an equity investment scenario. Um, with that being said, you know, this project is going to have to you know, attract a particular type of investor that's out there. Uh, I think the impact investors or or those looking to take advantage of certain tax credits, um, they are out there uh, and they are investing in broadband uh, in rural areas. Uh, so it's not just in uh, trying to build relationships with you know, banks, but it's also trying to build relationships with uh, these entities as well. Um, and, you know, of course, during the first two years of operations, free cash flow is negative, which leaves no funding for debt services. 
Um, let's see, there's a question that popped up here. Um, that's absolutely correct from John Elkins, investors uh, uh, who made the statement that investors may not be interested by ROI for homeowners, home sale prices, increases, et cetera. That's absolutely correct. That's something, you know, it's a compelling argument for. Hey, Drew, can I, can I just, just, can I just comment on yeah, that uh, too? I mean, it's a, that's a great point. Um, and, you know, going back to something that, that Drew said, you know, t take rate and the, the degree to which the community supports the project really impacts the financial performance um, uh, positively or negatively from the from the uh, model we're presenting you here today. So, you know, one of the, I think, really important roles for the CUD is helping to, to bring home the, the value proposition, just the way Mr. Elkins has, has, has put it, uh, put it there, among other reasons. Um, and, and, you know, being that bridge um, between um, the funding sources and the community um, it, it can, it can be an important role to help make the project more um, financially successful and feasible. But thank you for that. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Um, so we'll dive into the proposed financing structure. Um, what we're proposing is that the initial network owner is a limited term investor uh, with participation by the CUD. Uh, the network is initially financing a combination of equity and construction loan um, with interest rolled into principal. So, you know, kind of going back to the previous slide, um, where you're not seeing positive cash flows in the first two years, uh, we would recommend getting a, a construction loan uh, that functions in a sense that you, you won't be paying interest as you would in a typical loan, uh, but that interest will be rolled into the principal. Um, and then after construction, uh, that loan is refinanced um, after the network is built at a lower interest rate. Um, after 10 years, uh, we're proposing that the CD buys out the equity investor uh, using entirely debt financing. Uh, the cash flows at that point uh, in time we are projecting uh, would enable you to do that. Um, the, the purpose of this is to kind of entice uh, a potential investor uh, and provide them with a clear uh, exit strategy uh, so that they can actually take returns back to their investors. Um, a lot of we've a lot of the horizons or investment horizons uh, that these uh, these investors are looking at are in the, the seven to ten year range, um, and are more willing to go a little bit longer because they understand that uh, you know, broadband networks tend to be uh, take a little bit more time to be mature and to to ensure that the, the investment is uh, uh, gets a, a significant return. Um, the, the network operator, uh, it's worth mentioning, uh, can continue its role throughout this transition in the underlying network ownership. Um, that's, you know, ultimately, you know, 10 years down the line, you know, the decision of what the CED wants to do um, with the project, but we are assuming that the, the network operator uh, is going to be a, a consistent uh, uh, part of the, of the project going forward. Right. Next slide, Brent. Um, I seem to be stuck. Give me a moment. Yeah, take that. My apologies. Yeah, no worries. Um, so to kind of put a uh, a graphic in front of you that that shows the you know the proposed financing structure over time. Uh, as I mentioned, you have to take on a, a, a percentage of debt um, to finance the project. So starting out, you'd see be about 36% debt, 64% equity. Um, there would be the refinancing at month 25. So that would uh, you know, push the percentage of debt up because it, keep in mind, as I mentioned, uh, you're not paying interest. That interest is being rolled into principal. Uh, so the, you know, the, the overall cap stack will change uh, since you'll have a higher uh, debt principal that you need to be paying off uh, once you refinance the loan. Uh, and then at year 10, uh, the CUD acquisition um, will be done completely with debt, so 100% of debt financing. And to kind of you know, build on this a little bit more, um, 
I put together a very brief timeline uh, kind of highlighting the, the points we just discussed. Um, you know, month one, you've got your initial equity investment of 26, 27.6 million. Um, and then the, the uh, debt drawdown of 10 million. Uh, debt drawdowns can occur over you know, different times. Uh, we're just assuming for the sake of conversation uh, and presentation uh, that the debt drawdown will occur right at the beginning. Um, in month 25, you've had the reconstruction debt refinance to an interest only payment schedule. Uh, so that you would see, you, know, you can think of that more like a balloon payment at the end. Um, but you know, the, the financing, uh, you'll never get to that balloon payment because what will happen is uh, you'll acquire the, uh, the, uh, the network in month 121. I see there's some kind of back and forth here. Um, uh, from Sam and Anita, would our local ISPs be the one who would do the acquisition? Thanks, Chris, for replying. Uh, the assumption is that the CDD becomes, Chris said, the, the assumption that, is that the CDD becomes the network owner through the acquisition. Um, you know, they, in year 10, you know, that's, that's what Chris just said is the assumption in our model. Um, you know, in year 10, it, you know, there might be a different structure that's available. This is just kind of the proposed structure that we've. we've yeah, it, it, just, it just highlights the point, though, that, that um, you know, this is a, um, what we're, the uh, operating structure we're talking about here, the partnership structure, isn't um, an integrated network owner operator. You really have this model separated into, into two pieces. You have a, a contracted network operator. Right, so they're you know functionally providing a lot of the um, the services that you would um, often associate with the with the ISP, but the underlying uh, network owner is essentially a you know plan where you, you start in partnership with a with a with a private equity investor, but over time that becomes um, full CUD ownership of the underlying infrastructure, still having a contracted relationship with um, uh, with the network operator. Great question, though, and thanks, Chris. Um, there are a few more questions in the chat. That I think this is a good opportunity to address them too. For uh, just a, I think a Michael uh, Rooney kind of mentioned that the the mission is to to eventually own the network. Uh, thanks, Michael, for for kind of chiming in there. Um, kind of, I'm going to take a step back. I think here and, and then kind of regroup. Um, as I said, month 25, you'll see the construction debt re that will be refinanced interest only payment schedule or a, uh, a, a balloon payment. Um, but ultimately that balloon payment would never, would never come to fruition because uh, in month 121, there would be the acquisition um, where the CUD would acquire the network for 40 million, which is the value of the debt and equity. Uh, the, this deal can be financed 100%. Um, the investor, will pay off their debt uh, using the proceeds from the sale um, and will receive 38.3 million in cash uh, from the remaining proceeds of network and the project's next cash balance. Uh, the investor IRR would be 7%. So keep in mind in this timeline, we are looking at um, this from the investor's perspective uh, and trying to assess you know, how, you know, what an investor's return would be. 7% um, is a little bit uh, low for some of these investors. Um, with that being said, uh, and Freddie, if you want to move to the next slide, it's perhaps more than just a little bit low, but it is it is low. But it is yeah. a good segue into our next yeah. slide, how 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 the theme of which is how you can possibly raise that IRR above seven percent. Great, thanks, Fred. And uh, you know, as I, as he mentioned, it, it, you know, a little bit low, as in you know, typically. Uh, these investors are looking at, uh, you know, a minimum of eight, of eight uh, percent IRR to, uh, to as their investment hurdle or the, you know, the decision to go or no go uh, in an investment. Um, with that being said, what we've done is th there's other financing opportunities that are out there to take advantage to make this network more appealing to an investor. Um, our model doesn't assume that you're incorporating any of those uh, in a sense to basically allow, you know, 
as we you know potentially could be refining this business case, um, us to examine other partnerships and, and capture you know only upside, uh, you know in in some of the the opportunities that are out there. Um, so what you're looking at here is actually just the same thing. However, uh, we're also assuming that a three million dollar grant is received, which would be a fairly typical size grant um, for one of these projects. Uh, and ultimately what that yields is uh, an improvement of 1% in the IRR in month of 20, 121 for the investor, um, kind of putting you at that minimum threshold for an investment hurdle. Fred, more? Um, and then kind of circling, coming full circle here, we've also put together a, a pro forma cash flow for the, the seven town model or Stowe not being, uh, or, or a model where Stowe is not included. Um, you know, I do have to preface this with saying that, you know, without Stowe, uh, the project becomes uh, particularly challenging. Um, we are able to get the project to uh, cash flow positivity uh, by year three. However, we do have to restructure some of the, you know, uh, the financing. Um, for example, we're, we are assuming in this case uh, that the construction debt would be extended instead of a 24 month period, uh, a 36 month period to allow for more subscribers to come online uh, and uh, get you a, a stronger revenue base uh, that would allow you to, to manage some of the debt capacity uh, associated um, with, the, with the new financing or the, uh, or the refinancing rather. Um, you, you know, this, yeah, this project is a little bit tougher, um, but uh, again, uh, it is uh, it is uh, you know feasible if you are able to you know appropriately um, manage the financing. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Jane Campo, uh, who says if so if Stowe didn't participate and we added another town or towns, uh, they'd have to be densely populated. Is that correct? Um, Jane, I, I think that's, that's a, a good, uh, good inference. Um, you know, with that being said, it kind of depends on the towns that are added or, or the areas are, but you know, in general, uh, something comparable to Stowe, uh, would be would be beneficial, obviously beneficial or preferable in this case. Jane, I mean, it just in your region, Esto has a you know has a, a good uh, confluence of you know relative to other parts of the region density, uh, and um, as was sort of indicated in the in the survey portion, a relatively high level of interest. So that's a that's that's a definitely a beneficial combination um, to to add to the project and. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, not every town would be necessarily an exact uh, substitute for that. Right. And Good additional question in the chat window. I will point out it's a very appropriate time for questions. We're not at the end, but close to the end. So uh, let's continue answering those. That's right. Um, you know, Michael mentioned there are a town with a high percentage of unserved areas. Uh, it, yes, uh, you know that could be that could be an option. It, again, it, it, as Chris mentioned, it kind of it varies from uh, you know, town to town. Yeah, and one thing I would a perspective I would have on that is you know on uh, on its own, um, you know, unserved is a you know positive in that you tend to have higher interest, right, from from potential subscribers. Downside is that un, unserved tend to be unserved. Most frequently because of low density, which tends up to drive up your per subscriber uh, cost. So it's not necessarily true that a you know town with high unserved locations is going. If you add it, is going to be a, a net positive to the business case. That said, um, you know unserved areas um, are potential targets for grant applications. Um, some grant applications may be something that the um, uh, that the CUD is well positioned to go after. In other cases, it may be um, the network operator or the initial equity investor who's, who's better positioned to go after those. So uh, that's a factor that you can bring into play with, with unserved areas. 
Thanks, Chris. Um, Parker Guffey just chimed in. Why wouldn't you consider a, uh, a bond like other capital projects for community good? Um, that's certainly on the table. And in fact, Fred, if you want to move, it's a great question for me to, to um, I, I, that's actually, got, yeah, that's there's, actually, there's a sort that's of, that's actually Matt Parker's his son. I'm, Matt, Matt. Oh, Matt, I'm sorry, Matt. Um, we've identified several key risks and merits here. Uh, and you know, that is something we, that could be considered, uh, tax exempt debt is tends to be cheaper. Um, and that could protect, that could provide potential upside. There's also other, you know, uh, Debt financing sources that are out there that can provide you know, cheaper debt um, that are available for these projects. Chris, you wanted to—I kind of interrupted you there. But you're unmuted. Call, call attention to, to Matt that you know one particular constraint for uh, for CUDs in Vermont uh, is that uh, they aren't allowed to use general obligation bonding, so they they're not allowed to. You know, back their their bonds with um, municipal tax revenue. Um, they're really only allowed to to borrow against their revenues. Um, so that really is one of the constraints we had in mind. Uh, one of the reasons why um, you know it's difficult, more difficult uh, in the early phases for a CUD when they don't have a track record of generating revenue uh, to, to to you to, you know to quite as easily go. Um, uh, you know, to a bond. Those rules are different for CUDs than they are in some other local jurisdictions um, around the country. So in other, in other states, not every state, but in some states, you will see communities doing a bond, you know, backed by, by general revenues. Um, that is one, one model. It's just not one that we were at liberty to use here. If that was available to you, our modeling would take on a Quite a different nature. Um, Brett, I think there's another question in the chat. Uh, I think it's just a, a, a comment. Um, Fair enough. Or, or I, I guess from Sam and Anita is uh, economic solid point job creation regarding workers who build out and support the network. Um, I guess I, I don't quite understand the, <laughs> the question, uh, or is it just a comment? Uh, so Sam, um, you know, I, think he's, I think he's just asking who, who would uh, create and uh, run the network if it would be a local, uh, local company, if it would uh, create jobs, I think that's what they're asking. Got it. So um, I think one of the things that you, you saw earlier um, in, in the presentation, of course, this would be if you're establishing a public private partnership, it's going to depend a little bit on, on who the partners are. For the purposes of what we've presented to you today, we've assumed that the network owner has um, local staff who maintain the, the physical network. Um, we've assumed that the operations of this, the, the network operator, um, a lot of those functions um, are, are centralized to, to take advantage of some of the operating scale of a multiple operating multiple systems. Thanks, Chris. Um, there's been several questions here, and I, I just want to make sure we're, we're addressing uh, all of them. Uh, Richard Goff uh, asking my right that the uh, 1,248 left out premises represent 23 million. Is that of an 18K per premise? Uh, would Lining Center be financially viable? Um, is it, are we looking- it's 18K per premise in addition to the, the oh, thanks, bro. cost per yeah. premise after they were trimmed. So are those, the, the trimmed locations, the so-called high cost locations, the 1,200 or so were would cost over 6,000 per location to build to when after they're removed, the average cost per premise to build to is approximately four. Obviously don't have that figure on the screen. Yeah, it's actually uh, 2,341 per premise. It was um, after the trimming uh, 11%, which was um, 1,248 and that, 
equaled uh, to a cost savings of 38%, which is the, again, the 2,341 per premise. But I, I think, I think, you know, I think Richard's comment that, you know, the, the ones that we had to trim, you know, by nature of getting those cost savings, we're, we're focused on ones where the cost per premise is, is really high and dragging that average up. So, so you're right that, that um, you know, that does have a, the challenge of that those are extremely, you know, are especially high cost uh, premises. I think, um, two things. One, um, I, I think you look for opportunities uh, to do grant funding uh, for those um, for those premises. Also, I think you have the opportunity um, to, to take some time and do things like um, pre-subscription campaigns, where you know you you drag the the assumed take rate up and, and you improve the you know the business case. Um, that way, I think you know what combination of those kinds of things are you're going to need in, in each area. It's going to be a little bit of a case by case basis. One of the virtues, though, of of getting started with a network like this, where you have a, a public interest organization like a communications union district involved, is that all of a sudden uh, you've you've transformed these. Um, uh, very difficult to serve locations at the end of the line from you know multi-million dollar problems that you have to solve in order to get them to get them served into you know a series of much more uh, small of a much smaller and more digestible chunks. So you're once you have that network sort of up up and running, you have you know more of the ability to say okay well this year um, you know with this funding source and you know this pre-subscription campaign, for instance, we're going to tackle, you know, this remaining road and, and then we're going to tackle this one and then we're going to tackle this one. Um, it, and you can't really tackle them individually, at, um, you know, until you have a network at scale. Once you have a network at scale, um, then you, you, can, you can address them in more bite-sized chunks. Thank you, Chris. Chris. Drew, any uh, additional questions in the chat window that you want to address? I think uh, Matt just asked a question. He said, uh, can you briefly explain the difference you see with uh, Vermont CUD versus other rural communities around the country you work with? Um, you know, to be you know, positive here, Matt, um, it's really, if you want to look at the, you know, the A-Town project, the, the healthy operational cash flows you're able to get um, in this area, a lot of, um, uh, communities across across the country aren't able to get to that operational scale, um, so that's something that's a uh, a positive uh, a positive for for Lemoyne um, in, in, in looking at this analysis. The other thing I would add is just to do a compare and contrast. I, you know, I, I would say that um, CUDs in Vermont, in terms of the the tools that you have, are you know, neither the weakest nor the strongest in terms of the spectrum you see across the country. Um, you know, you, 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 you know, it really ranges um, from in some states and local jurisdictions, like I said, you can, you know, you, you can have pretty extensive um, community involvement in the financing. Um, they can take a, you know, an even more activist role than, as I've described. In other communities, they're completely prohibited from, you know, getting anywhere near this, right? Um, so, you know, CUDs, I think, are um, a little bit more uh, of a middle ground um, between, those, um, uh, between those two extremes. Thanks, Chris. Um, so to kind of, uh, you know, wrap things up here from, from the uh, financial analysis perspective, I identified several key risks and merits um, for this project. Um, you know, key risks. Uh, interest rate risks right now, uh, the Fed has set the interest rates at a, a very low level. Um, we're looking at a 10 to 20 year time frame um, in terms of cash flows. Uh, those in low interest rates might not persist and could, could adversely affect the, the project if, if they go, if interest rates go up. Um, partnership risks, you know, finding the appropriate network operator uh, and finding the appropriate investor. Uh, like I said, you need to find uh, an investor who, who is going to look to take advantage of certain tax exempt statuses or uh, you know, an impact investor. 
Um, they are out there, like as I mentioned, and they are investing in broadband in rural areas. Um, it, it, but you know, that, that is uh, perhaps one of the more you know, significant uh, risks that are you know, baked into this, this project. Uh, construction risks, um, fairly typical with every construction project out there. Uh, there can be delays, there can be increased costs associated with labor, increased costs associated with components. Um, you know, those, those are fairly typical uh, in every construction project and they're not unique, uh, but they are there. Uh, and take rate risks, as I mentioned, uh, your, your take rate is, uh, is really a linchpin to the success and failure of this project. Uh, and failing to uh, attain a particular or a set take rate can, um, uh, that meets the, the capital needs of the project can, can really you know, adversely impact um, you know, in, uh, the project overall and, 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 and success. Um, merits, as I mentioned, strong cash flows provide flexibility uh, in terms of you know, how you do financing. Uh, and your financing available in particular as, uh, as the project is built after that construction period. Um, as I mentioned, the model does not currently incorporate more sophisticated debt and financing options, uh, such as opportunity zones, municipal tax exempt debt, partnerships, subsidies, and other government financing that can uh, materially uh, affect the project in a, in a positive way. Um, you know, further refinement of the business case can also yield significant returns as we get a, a better idea of, uh, 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 of the project scope and, and uh, the, the requirements of the project. Um, and, uh, you know, the net cash position in year 10, so going back to the health of the cash flows, um, is, is fairly good. Uh, and so that cash can provide uh, increased flexibility and also be a benefit um, to a partner, you know, seeking a, a, an exit dividend or, you know, trying to refinance in a different way at year ten that, we, that we've suggested. Uh, so, like I said, healthy cash flows provide you with more flexibility, and I think that's probably one of the strongest merits of this project. I think we have one or two additional questions in the chat here. Great. Yeah. If you, want, if you want to keep going? I'll 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 try to address some, and then maybe we can clean uh, do clean up at the end. Right. Okay. Actually, we are just one slide away from the end, so why don't I polish it up, and then we'll spend the last uh, fifteen minutes or so um, on questions and answers. Um, so the the timeline is we'll have the draft, the uh, the final uh, report in PDF format uh, by the end of the week. I'll incorporate some of the feedback from the Q and A and your concerns from this call in that report. I will say that a, a, an aspect of our report is the ArcGIS online map, which does contain a great deal of information. The broadband survey results, the survey results from your market research survey, uh, the high level designs, um, and quite a bit of additional information as well that you can look at in great detail. So uh, anyone that wants any more, uh, any additional information regarding that online map, please just reach out directly to me, that would be fine. Um, and regarding the, the next steps for the planning, obviously with the feasibility study in the two forms, both cash flow positive within three years, within, you know, with some of the, the caveats that we have discussed, we could potentially uh, proceed to the business planning phase. And some of the things that we will incorporate for the business planning phase would be, as we've mentioned a few times during the presentation, there's, you know, optimization that can be performed on the high level design that could potentially lead to some cost savings we took a relatively conservative approach to the cost estimating for the high level design. Certainly not a wildly conservative approach, but a, an appropriately conservative approach. And there is potentially some cost savings that we might be able to find when we take a very close look at optimizing the high level design. Incorporate the market analysis in a little bit more thoroughly to inform our take rate assumptions, although we are fairly comfortable that the 45% take rate uh, is a, it's an appropriate take rate uh, 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 a figure to, to conduct the, the, the feasibility analysis and most likely to also 
conduct the business uh, case analysis and business business planning, but we will re revisit that and, and uh, make sure. Optimization of the financial models as well. And as Drew mentioned, we, there's a few points that he uh, addressed where we can look a little bit more carefully about the optimization. And he just mentioned some of those. Um, I think of particular interest, we will explore in detail. Uh, there, there will be a potential funding sources section on the deliverable that you'll get before the end of the week that was not on the, the uh, initial draft version. Um, but for the business planning, we will, we will take a very, very close, careful look at any major potential sources of funding, grant funding in particular, probably largely federal grant funding that could have an impactful effect on the network. In the example that we gave earlier with the three, $3 million grant, Drew mentioned something about, and I don't mean to, to, to harp on Drew's comment, that being some, some, something of a, a, a reasonable anticipated amount. I, I, I'm not entirely sure I would use that characterization. Um, grant, there's, there's a difference between grant funding uh, that's available and grant funding that's available that will really that is large enough substantial enough to have a real impactful effect and uh, a three million dollar grant um, in one year is uh, you know that that would be a substantial figure um, something else to keep in mind in terms of grant funding and the influx of grant funding uh, capital is that grant funding opportunities tend to be annual some of them can be revisited but that means that the grant funding amounts don't come in one lump sum in month one. They might come in you know, month one, month 13, month, month 25. So that's something we will take into account during the business planning. As well as, you know, I, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, Fred. I, if you could wrap up really quickly because we have yeah. some very important questions okay. in the chat that I'd like to get to. I'm two seconds away from wrapping up. There's just further optimization. And of course, then we will position the, the, the business model to solicit interest from both network developers and investors. And I'll stop the screen share to uh, open the floor up to, uh, to questions. Um, well, I noted one question sort of backtracking in the chat. Tim Humphrey is asking if you didn't have a three-year break-even requirement what are the biggest changes you would make to the proposal? Um, so I had responded to, to, to Tim, and I, I, I'll invite Drew to, Drew to follow on, uh, follow on me uh, if he has a, any additional perspective. You know, I think, you know, if you I, didn't I, have... I, I just I, would like to, you know, not everybody has a chance to follow the chat. I would appreciate if the response could go to the whole group. Oh, sure. Thanks. Yes, that's... Yeah, yeah, happy to do that. Actually, yeah, just just about to do that. Um, so, um, I, I would say, you know, one thing that you could consider um, would be, uh, you know, debt financing that incorporated some greater amount of initial operating losses. However, I, I don't know that that would actually necessarily be a better model. Um, in, in general, when we've been running these things, we we have seen that you know the 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 it helps the outcomes of the model to have um, a fast construction period you know get through that initial construction period start to get customers on um, uh, drive that that revenue so um, you know I think that there might be some ability if you didn't have that three year constraint to consider some things where you had operating losses for longer. I'm not sure that that doing those things would necessarily give you a better financial outcome. Yeah, and I think you you should look at Burlington as a model too. They uh, they basically, as far as I understand it, got an 18 million dollar uh, gift of money from the city for a little while, but then they paid for it in spades. Um, hey, Tim Humphrey, are you? Happy with the with the response, and we can move on to another question. Yeah, the the only cl further clarification I would ask for is, it it sounds great to have that equity partner, but is there a strong precedent for that type of capital showing up 
especially at the assumed returns? Yeah. Um, go ahead, Drew. Tim, that's a great question. I mean, that is one of the reasons why we highlighted uh, partnership risks as one of the core risks associated with the project. Um, it is going to, you're going to have to find a particular type of investor uh, that's going to be interested in, in investing um, in this type of project uh, that's going to take advantage of tax exempt status or tax credit status uh, or opportunity zones or something uh, along those lines um, or an impact investor. There is precedent. Uh, this is something that um, is actually becoming more and more common uh, to bring in an equity investor into across the country. Uh, as these projects are, are uh, being stood up, there's, there's a real appetite right now to invest uh, in broadband infrastructure. Um, so the timing is right. Uh, with that being said, uh, you know, it is of course a risk. Are you gonna be able to find someone who is, who's willing to, to work with you? Um, you know, again, one of the merits I've, uh, you know, of the projects or the, uh, the model that we put forward is that we aren't assuming any, you know, more, any sophisticated financing tools are being used outside of debt and equity. Uh, so there is an opportunity that, you know, more sophisticated or government backed financing um, could be incorporated that just provides a, you know, a, a strong potential upside uh, to the project. Um, Tim, another thing I would say is that I, I think you're, you know, you're drawing the right conclusion that we're, and we're, we're not presenting to you a business case that for, for that, you know, in kind of investor that's, you know, an absolute slam dunk. That's, that's, that's a, that's a range where, you know, you're going to have to work, uh, to, as Drew said, find the right investor. But then the other thing I would call attention to is that, you know, we see as these projects sort of move closer to, to being real and to be impl implementable. Um, that there is a push to value engineer them, to, you know, look for, you know, savings, uh, look for supplemental opportunities. And so, you know, we, I think our conclusion on this is, um, you know, the outcome that we're seeing here is not, you know, so great that, you know, we necessarily think there's going to be a line around the block, you know, for this tomorrow, um, but it is, you know, um, uh, within a range that it would be worthwhile uh, to continue to get those optimizations, find the right partner, um, you know, to do the work um, that, that um, you know, it, it's within a range where doing the work is worth, you know, could, could very well be worth the while. How does... Thank you. And, and just one final, one final point. Um... Should everyone think about every dollar of grant funding received offsetting a dollar of equity that's required? Uh, equity financing. Yeah, that's actually a really great question. Um, you could even think of it as a, a, a offsetting potential debt, depending on the timing of when the, when the grant funding would be available. Um, but yes, you know, that, that is something uh, you, you can kind of think it, it is some, a way you can think about it. Again, it depends on the structure of the grant, really, um, and how it applies to the model. So, if it's an offer, you know, let's it, we're, we're speaking hypothetically here. You're getting a grant that's upfront. Sure, it can offset debt. You don't have to take on as much um, you know, financing. If you can lower debt service, it's better for the operating model. Or if it's you know a, a you know, type of grant that's coming out over a series of months or years, uh, you know, it, it, it might figure into the model a different way. Um, so it, it kind of just depends on how, you know, that type of funding, you know, comes through and how it would apply to, you know, to, to the model. You have to look at it more case by case, if, if that makes sense. Thank you, Drew. Um, let's move on to another question because we have a few questions in the chat lining up and I think we are running out of time. Let me, let me take the, the next one in line from Richard Joff, which is uh, what is the protected borrower service area? That's one of the layers on the map that is uh, that does require explanation. So thank you for asking. That is uh, That refers to uh, broadband infrastructure funding opportunities through the United States Department of Agriculture. 
which does conduct some of the country's more significant uh, broadband funding disbursement programs. Um, unfortunately, uh, VTEL Wireless received funding from the USDA uh, sometime, I believe it was 2009. Chris can correct me if I'm wrong. Yep. And uh, therefore, the areas that are shaded, I believe it's in a lavender color, I don't have the map in front of me, are within the protected borrower service area, the protected broadband borrower service area, and therefore, unfortunately, are currently ineligible for additional broadband infrastructure funding from the, from the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. However, everything outside of that area that lacks uh, currently this, the, the threshold is 10-1 service from the USDA is eligible for USDA funding programs. And that, that is a program that we would most likely recommend uh, thinking about incorporating for, for a, an infusion of uh, additional capital to, uh, to make the project more attractive to an equity investor. Um, the next question, is there a guarantee the initial network operator would be willing to have the CUD to acquire the network after 10 years? Would a guarantee to this effect be included as part of the original terms? Um, I'll be real brief and maybe Chris or Drew would like to. Uh, I, can, I can handle that one. Thank you. Uh, so I, I think this is definitely a point of negotiation when you're when you're talking to an investor. I think it's important for us to point out as a clarification to this that the IRRs that the um, the, the rate of returns that we we modeled include the value from the sale to the CUD right that's financed by the borrowing. So in the particular um, model that we have. Here, I think it would be of value to the investor to know that the CUD actually wants to, to, to take it because without that sort of cash out, um, without that refinancing, actually um, um, their return uh, uh, is, is pretty dismal. Um, so, but you know, do you, I think that uh, if you're entering into a, a public private partnership, um, and to the extent that the public-private partnership, you know, includes this uh, transition, I think that's a, you know, that's a point of, of negotiation that you would have. And I think it would benefit both parties um, to really, you know, have a clear and consistent understanding about what the rights and obligations of the partners uh, were with regard to that, because it's one of the more important uh, potential terms of the partnership. And if, if I may j just add that, uh, especially with respect to how we went through the, especially the first 10 years of the model, it is quite possible that the first 10 years of the model, there will be three key players, the CUD, the equity investor, the, equi the owner for the first 10 years, plus a network operator, and the network operator is not the, the equity investor. I suppose, oh, thanks, Fred. <laughs> yeah. I suppose it is possible the equity investor plays the role of, of, of operator, but I think more likely than not, there would be an equity investor, a network operator, and then the CUD, and then at, at, in, month 25, in, in month 121, excuse me, the equity investor disappears, the, the CUD becomes the owner, and probably the relationship with the network operator continues. There are other potential scenarios. Uh, another question, if it is written into the operator's contract or agreement, that is the way it will happen. Uh, yeah. I think it was in reference to what you just spoke about. Excellent. That right. was an answer, not a question. Yeah, I think he was answering. <laughs> I, I only figured that out once I got to the end and there was no question. <laughs> My apologies. Um, any additional questions? Are there rural examples where the local utilities become the network operators? Um, are there examples of rural? Thinking about like the electric utilities? Where the local, well, it's communications union district. Yeah. I, I, we, I can give, I can give two, two examples. Uh, far yeah, that's, the that's exactly what I'm asking about is, you know, the word on the street is like, if our utilities wanted to become the network operators, that's not really part of their core mission. Right. That doesn't necessarily mean they're not interested, but they would have to spin up another part of their business to become the operator. I mean, they own the poles, et cetera, et cetera. So it makes, on one level can make sense to them, mm -hmm. but on the other, 
they're they're all about providing electricity to the home, not fiber to the home. So do you yeah. have examples where in a rural environment such as Vermont, where we have a lot of co-ops, et cetera, where utilities have said, yeah, this would be a good a good thing for our business, even though you would have to spin up another part of our business. Oh, there are, you know, re if, if we do not take into account the particulars of how the networks start and how they get financed and, and, and cross that initial enormous hurdle, there are dozens or dozens and dozens of examples of uh, small electric co-ops entering the, the retail broadband business, rural broadband, uh, rural fiber to the premise business. Um, so, I mean, throughout the country. Uh, In general though, uh, one thing I would say is that um, I think Fred is right that the, you know, the most common examples I think you see of that uh, are co-ops and municipal uh, utilities. And I think one important caveat for Vermont is that um, uh, electric utilities uh, also participating in an unregulated business is something that traditionally uh, there's been a pretty high regulatory hurdle in Vermont, and Vermont is different than some other states where even the muni munis and co-ops are, are regulated by the, the State Public Utility Commission. So that's not to say that it's impossible. Uh, and I, I think that, um, you know, that certainly the current pandemic has thrown into high relief uh, the, uh, the need that is out there. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we have seen in Vermont um, uh, utilities being uh, more motivated than ever before to be at least part of the solution, even if they're not the solution. Um, but you know, it, it's it's important to say that with with the background that you know traditionally um, th those hurdles have been a little bit higher in Vermont um, for those entities than they have been in some places. There's a question about telephone service. Um, if you look at <clears throat> Uh, graphs of anticipated take rate for telephone service among um, residential users, it's, it's a pretty steep trend downward. However, telephone service for commercial and enterprise and uh, enterprise customers is, is viable. The cost of providing telephone service for a retailer is not high. There's so many turnkey wholesale providers to rely on. Um, and there are kind of sort of nifty landline options. You can get a landline number. You could choose to have that landline number appear on a cell phone app instead of on your landline or in addition to your landline. So there, there's, there's some, some hope for that. Um, but it's probably worth keeping just for the commercial and enterprise customers part of it. Yeah, and Fred, just to piggyback on that, I mean, our model doesn't assume that every single customer is going to be getting uh, phone service. Uh, so we, uh, uh, it's a service, you know, so it doesn't necessarily figure into the model as a core revenue driver, but as a service offering it uh, can be a, a means of attracting more people uh, or more customers to the network. Um, and since there is so many turnkey you know, uh, you know, partnerships that are out there, it's, you, you might as well offer it uh, so that you can ensure that you're able to get, get the appropriate you know, clientele or uh, if someone's making a decision on whether to, to go with your network or not, um, you know, they're, you know, they're not looking and saying, well, you don't offer phone. You don't, you don't have someone saying that uh, when they're making their decision. Right. Still not Thanks sure. If that um, play, it looks like yeah. It looks like most of the questions are slowing down. Is there any other questions that somebody wants to throw across to us? Yeah, I just throw this one out verbally because I couldn't type fast enough. And part of this is just sort of dispelling things as I speak to my friends and neighbors. Do you know of any scenarios where rural? Uh, unified districts or like entities have just about made it to the finish line, but then the big players come in and go, yeah, that's nice, but we can undercut you by X margin and we'll finally get in the game. 
Um, you know, people have brought that to my attention as a risk. If we do all of this, but Comcast and Consolidated come in and say, yeah, that's all well and good, but we'll finally, uh, you know, do what we're all of a should have always done and undercut you guys by a huge amount. Has that, has that happened? I think you always have to take into account if you're doing, uh, let me sort of answer that in like three parts. Part number one is um, where you're competing against the incumbent. And I think, you know, probably the strongest competition to a fiber network is going to be where there's cable service, right? Mm -hmm. I think you have to take into account that there's going to be a competitive response, right? So yeah, that's a risk. Um, and um, uh, point number two, though, is that, you know, generally, um, uh, uh, the fiber to the premise network should be the, you know, the, the best highest quality network. And, and generally, you know, especially in, in more rural markets, um, you know, at least in the, in the fiber part of the space, the first one there gen generally wins the competition to occupy that space. Doesn't mean they won't face competition from, you know, from the, the cable company in particular, um, but, um, you know, pretty low risk of them getting overbuilt um, by fiber. Um, third point on that is that, uh, you know, that risk in particular is one of the factors that um, argues somewhat for doing this in the context of a public-private partnership where the private entity um, has, uh, you know, has the, the, the risk, um, of, especially in the early years, um, of, of performing, you know, achieving that take rate. Now, that won't be, you know, if, if you transfer that risk, it won't be a costless one, right? The, the private party is going to want, you know, greater assurance of, of their ability to achieve an upside on the back end if they are successful. But um, the existence of that, you know, performance risk is, one of the reasons why public entities, which tend to be more risk adverse, you know, need a higher level of certainty. Uh, you know, if they can if they can transfer some of that risk, uh, downside risk to the private party in exchange for transferring some of the upside opportunity to them as well, um, that that's often um, a good uh, a, a good balancing in the public private partnership. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Yep. Another question in the chat. What does uh, Seven Town T2 cabinet mean? Um, Mr. Rooney, I, I gave a few uh, a few folks in Leia's group um, a, a something of a tutorial on how to navigate that uh, ArcGIS online map and be willing to repeat that process if somebody's willing to do, uh, facilitate it. Um, but to answer your specific question, uh, the seven town group of layers is the seven town design. So the CUD member towns without Stowe and a T2 cabinet is, Brett, correct me if I'm wrong, that is a, a passive field cabinet. So it's a cabinet that is that contains uh, GPON splitters. So a cabinet that does not require electricity that just has uh, fiber splitters uh, for the GPON system um, that receives the fiber, the feeder fiber from the T3 cabinets, which contain the active electronics, so powered cabinets that have the, uh, the primary GPON OLT ports, and those connect the passive cabinets, the T2 cabinets, and from the T2 cabinets leave uh, distribution fiber in a one-to-one -one ratio, so one fiber per house plus spares, and uh, each, uh, each house has its own own strand of fiber dedicated back to each T2 cabinet. Um, and Fred, just to follow up on that, I did record that presentation. So oh. anybody who would like to access it, um, it's available. And for the LFCUD board members, it's actually available in our Dropbox. So you can go there and it's there right now. Fantastic. Um, I would support Brett, you've earlier said that maybe the questions are slowing down and maybe it's a good time to wrap up. Um, so I'm not hearing any opposition, so let's do that. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much, Tilson team for, for taking time and, and present to us. Um, 
this meeting is being recorded as well. So we can go back to it if we need to. And we look forward to the full study with a little more of a narrative to accompany the slides that you've presented today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Very, very well done. Thank you so much. Appreciate all the hard work and effort. Thank you for thank saying you. that. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Appreciate Take care. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rooney, if you want to just forward me that question um, via email, I'll be happy to respond independently. The one we didn't get to. 